So currently we are uh, online. So we'll start uh, the program in another two minutes. So currently we are uh, online. So we'll start uh, the program. Good evening, friends. Good evening, Professor Kreider, Dr. Navin Takkar, and Dr. Ramesh and all friends who were online. Actually, from the Institute, our Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Trauma and Orthopedics, just last month we decided to go for this kind of webinars because, because of the COVID, we are not able to meet personally. Everybody knows this. That is why, even though there are so many webinars going on in another country, the city, and over the globally also. So still, I decided to conduct this webinar from our institute and inviting an eminent professor in their field from all over the world. Last time we had first webinar we had on lower end of bracket radius. This time we have decided to do on pelvic vestibular injuries. Today we have our professor, a well known professor from Toronto. Professor Crader from Toronto, he is going to share his knowledge and experience, whatever the tips and tricks. Definitely, we are expecting to know, even though we are managing the, these fractures day to day, we expect Professor Crader to give some tips and tricks in managing a stable of fractures. And also, I invite, I am really thankful to Dr. Ramesh sir. He readily agreed to be with us and who really doesn't require any introduction. Our country knows him very well. And Dr. Uday Kumar he is my close friend. Dr. Lokesh is also with us. I think you can, uh, we can see him on the Line. And we have Dr. Navin Takkar. So, actually, the webinar is co hosted with the Gujarat Orthopedic Association, and Dr. Navin Takkar is on board and he is going to coordinate with the Gujarat Orthopedic Association. So, my assignment and job is introduce and tell some all about our speaker, guest speaker, Professor Crader. But it is not possible 
in few minutes to tell about so, uh, so many pages. Actually, I asked uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Omshi, give me some uh, in a brief. So, you know, we cannot uh, keep on uh, uh, talk about the Professor Crider for a uh, long time because it is for the uh, lecture on the pelvis tabular fracture. Professor Crider obtained his MD degree from the University of Toronto in 1985. He holds additional degrees such as FRCS, Fellowship in Lower Limb Reconstruction Surgery from Toronto Hospital and Research Fellowship from Hospital Sick Children Toronto. He is an American board certified orthopedic surgeon. Currently, he is a member of AO Board Trustees, Professor of Orthopedics and Core Faculty Clinical Program at the University of Toronto and scientist at Sun, Sunny Brook Research Institute. His achievements are very vast, impossible, as today I told, impossible to told within a short time. I'm going to highlight some of his important works. He has received multiple Edwin G. Bill awards for the best paper presentation at OEA Meet, was awarded with inaugural AAOS OREF L Services Fellowship by AAOS. In 2007, he received President's Award from Canadian Orthopedic Association for outstanding contribution to orthopedics in Canada. Professor Crater has conducted numerous trials at various capacities. He has published over 200 articles, written more than 20 books, chapters. That is very important. So he has contributed to, contributed for 20 books chapters. Has given lectures for numerous organizations across the world and was invited as a visiting professor to various universities. He is a regular faculty for AO Trauma Pelvic Vestibular Fracture Management. I think uh, we have all attended this Pelvic Vestibular Fracture uh, course, AO course, I think we all know him. For the last couple of years, was a course director for AOS and OTA, Fracture Pelvis Tabular. Vestibular. He's a world-renowned experienced trauma surgeon with a special interest in Pelvis Tabular Drama. Also runs fellowship program for the same at his, the Sunnybrook Hos uh, Hospital. We are fortunate, honored to have him to be here with us and to give talk uh, for our institute and organizations. I welcome Professor Crader and I invite you to give talks. I think he is going to give three lectures. One is man acute management of vestibular fracture. Second, on fragility fracture, osteoporotic fractures. Third talk will be case-based discussion. Our uh, professor, Dr. Uday Kumar, also has got some uh, x-rays. I think uh, Dr. Ramesh, if he has got some many x-rays cases, he can uh, put it on the screen and we can discuss. And finally, he's going to share tips, tricks, and strategy, strategies in management. And also, I personally request Professor Crader to highlight on some percutaneous rupture fixation of a stabulum. So is I expect will going to give us tips to how to fix by percutaneous. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, it's a great uh, a great privilege to share some some thoughts with my friends and colleagues. I've had the privilege of meeting many of you in person, and uh, uh, it's it's truly a privilege. I wish uh, we could be in the same room and and share stories and. Um, and uh, cases in real time, but uh, these are interesting times for all of us and uh, difficult times. Here are my disclosures, uh, which we're required at our university to uh, disclose with any presentations that we give. And this is the first of uh, three uh, talks that I've prepared, but I've tried to uh, make all of this uh, case-based and to, um, 
really, I, I understand there's a range of, of participants here from residents and learners at an earlier stage to very experienced faculty and colleagues. So I've tried to, uh, even in the, the sort of more simple aspects, uh, have something there that hopefully uh, will, will be appropriate for, for everybody to, uh, to get something out of. So uh, this first talk, the uh, objectives are basically to describe the emergency management and uh, to um, talk about uh, the uh, indications for surgical treatment uh, and the principles of management. So this is the most basic of the uh, three uh, uh, discussion uh, points. In, in our experience, and I'm sure in yours too, uh, a pelvic ring injury is often associated with an acetabular fracture, such as this uh, very um, severely injured person who was hit by a train. And the priority is to save this person's life. And really that involves uh, the management of a pelvic ring that's unstable. And uh, I think of this as sort of uh, a couple of different basic principles. Stop any external bleeding and this is a different case, but uh, has an open wound. And it doesn't look like much, but this patient uh, might be hypotensive. And once you resuscitate them, the bleeding starts. So whenever you see an open wound, I uh, pack that uh, and in anticipation of the fact that if their uh, blood pressure is uh, improved, it can really cause a lot of bleeding in a very short period of time. And these wounds can be anywhere from the perineum to the rectum or vagina and posterior as well. So they need to be looked for. Um, the other area of bleeding, of course, is internal. And uh, we all know that uh, a pelvic ring that expands uh, can't tamponade. And it also can hide a massive amount of blood in the pelvic ring. And this is the formula for the volume of a cylinder, R squared H and a binder or a sheet uh, is, is the correct uh, application in the emergency department. And an acetabular fracture really doesn't get in the way. If there's an acetabular fracture, or in this case, a proximal femur fracture, uh, the important thing is to save the person's life and stop the internal bleeding. We're all familiar with the vascular anatomy of the pelvis. It's got a vast number of uh, blood vessels that uh, are from, from larger to smaller vessels, but they can bleed uh, extensively. And a pelvis that's moving around can't form a clot and will continue to bleed. And this is uh, a case that uh, you can imagine the disruption of the pelvic vessels there and how much hemorrhage is uh, going to occur in a very quick period of time by the disruption of those blood vessels that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, you can't form a clot, and at least there's going to be venous bleeding, which is the majority of cases, but in 10%, there's going to be some arterial bleeding, at least in our series uh, here, and the strategies to stop that arterial bleeding are angiogram, reboa, or pelvic packing, and it depends on your institution, and if, if this is of interest, we can discuss this later, but it's really quite institution dependent. And then as far as the acetabulum goes, there are really only two things we can do. Reduce a dislocated joint uh, and remove pressure from the femoral head, and that involves traction. So, uh, you know, to the emergency treatment of the acetabulum is really the emergency treatment of the pelvis and the patient overall, and then these two very simple things. So, you know, this is a, a by and large, a, a very advanced uh, group, and uh, we're all familiar with the imaging and classification. So I just wanted to highlight a couple things maybe for the earlier learners that might be on this, this call. The iliopectineal line is the pelvic brim, except for the very cranial part. Uh, you'll see that the iliopectineal line in red comes down to the second sacral foramen, but the iliopectineal or the pelvic brim rather, obviously goes up uh, above that. And so uh, just be aware that the iliopectineal line more cranially is not the pelvic brim, it's just in the distal part, the pelvic brim. The ilioischial line is shown here. And uh, this is from Letournel's original um, 
drawing. And basically it's this chunk of bone of the quadrilateral plate that forms the ilioischial line. And one of the important things for learners uh, at an earlier stage to recognize is that you can have a disruption of the ilioischial line without a posterior column fracture. That's the posterior border of the posterior column in green. And you can see that the red line can be disrupted with an anterior type of injury, a fragility fracture that involves the quadrilateral plate, but does not involve the posterior border of the posterior column, often a point of confusion, at least in our residence uh, here. The teardrop is simply what you see there, the uh, uh, line from the, the, or the teardrop from the cotyloid fossa to the quadrilateral plate. And finally, the radiological roof is just that small tangent at the top. And here is a point that uh, I, I try to hammer home to our learners here. When we talk about the rim or the lip, we use the, the term wall and lip or rim interchangeably, but they're really not the same. So uh, here I insist that uh, when they're talking about the lip or the rim, they refer to it as such. And that's really just that point, that red point all the way up and down. Whereas the wall is a chunk, you know, it's like you've taken a chunk of the wall out. You can have a fracture through the rim or a line that goes through the rim without having an anterior or posterior wall fracture. And the same applies to the posterior rim and the posterior wall. Again, often a point of some confusion uh, with our residents and learners where they see a fracture line going through the rim and uh, are, are confused as to whether that's a wall fracture or not. Here's the orientation of the different fractures and the original drawing from Letournelle about the, the columns and so on. And the reason we do that is that sometimes we don't really see much. And uh, when I show this slide to our uh, earlier learners, about half of them see that there's an issue. But once you start going through the lines, you can immediately see that this is the intact side. And here, there's a posterior wall fracture. And now on the Jade views, it's very obvious. And uh, the lines stand all of us in good stead. And we, uh, you know, uh, have, have really not uh, learned much more about classifying than uh, Letournelle in his, uh, in his original book uh, taught us. Uh, I don't think there's been really much uh, advance in that regard. So here's uh, just a very brief discussion about operative or non-operative management. So this is a patient who came to us as a 16-year-old male, uh, difficult reduction. They tried three times outside and he's got no other injuries and this small posterior wall. And uh, we can, again, if this is of interest, discuss later, but in my hands, I don't do an EUA. I don't do uh, a stress test of any sort. If there was a dislocation and if there is any sort of posterior wall, then in my um, opinion, uh, that is uh, something that I would fix. Although Paul Ternetta has published on this uh, early on and has also shown series where non-operative management was quite successful without any late instability or degenerative changes. But uh, this is something that our, our residents would need to be aware of. This is uh, a little bit more, we'll get a little bit more interesting now. So surgical approaches, the, the options are for a posterior column or a wall, the Cocher Langenbeck and Gibson, and for the anterior column, the ilioinguinal, uh, AIP, iliofemoral, Smith-Peterson. We'll talk about all of these with some cases in a minute. Uh, and then the extended approach, which uh, is still still has a role today and we'll, we'll go through that with a, with a case. Obviously for a posterior wall, such as the case we just showed, this would be the approach options. And uh, the important thing is obviously to protect the sciatic nerve by keeping the knee flexed and the hip extended, but there are other nerves to protect as well. And here are the sort of the choices. The Kocher Langenbeck is the most posterior approach, splits the gluteus maximus, the original description of the Gibson, and then the modified Gibson approach. And I've gone exclusively for all posterior approaches, uh, pretty much to the Gibson approach. And uh, I'll show you why. 
So this is the inferior gluteal nerve, so named because it comes out inferior to the piriformis muscle and innervates the gluteus maximus, and it branches uh, quite quickly. And uh, you can see that if you were to carry that Cocher-Langenbeck incision posterior, you would um, probably divide some of those branches. And you know, when I did a Cocher-Langenbeck, I would put a suture around to prevent it from splitting more cranially. But yet I had one patient who was very unhappy. This is not that patient. This is a, a picture from the archives who had a, a, an inferior gluteal nerve branch injury and uh, atrophy of part of the gluteus maximus. And uh, the Cocher-Langenbeck uh, approach, uh, you know, has that as a risk. It uh, uh, certainly um, doesn't happen in all cases, but I've had one case and um, that uh, prompted me to explore the Gibson for more and more cases. And now it's what I use exclusively. This is, uh, uh, a picture, it's hard to, to, this is a cadaver, but the leg is to the screen's right and the head is to the left and the three red dots are perforating vessels that come out at the leading edge of the gluteus maximus. And if you follow those vessels, you will have the correct interval for the Gibson approach and have a minimum of dissection in terms of peeling off the gluteus maximus and separating it from the tensor fascia lata. And you can carry that as cranial as you want. You have to watch the gluteus medius underneath. The other thing to, uh, that's uh, very important to recognize is the ascending branch of the medial femoral circumflex. And that's at risk if you take down any part of the quadratus but you do need to be careful even a bit more cranially when taking down the obturator and turnus. So uh, we take great care to uh, identify the vessel between the uh, inferior gemellus and the quadratus. And uh, the uh, ascending branch is, of course, lateral to that and deep to that. But that's a good landmark to not go distal or, or caudal to. And then I don't use uh, in my practice any routine prophylaxis except for the extended iliofemoral approach. But uh, uh, early on in my practice, I certainly had a great uh, many patients with a little bit or even a lot of heterotopic bone. And I think it's because I was less competent or less confident doing a traumatic surgical technique. I was probably retracting more aggressively and causing muscle trauma and then not recognizing that and resecting it. So one of the things that uh, Chip Rout to is one of my mentors taught me is to uh, look carefully at the gluteus minimus at the end of a posterior approach. And almost always this caudal portion is uh, either from the injury or from the dissection damaged. And uh, it's a good idea to resect that to minimize the risk of heterotopic bone. So I do that routinely now and uh, try to be a little bit more gentle with my dissection than I was earlier in my career. And I have uh, not needed to uh, use routine uh, prophylaxis. Uh, we should talk briefly in the posterior aspect about marginal impaction. We all know what that looks like. Here's a case of mine. You can see the femoral head and the impacted area. The next slide will show that impacted area elevated and bone grafted behind it. And one of the things that I now do is to secure that piece with flat headed intra cancella screws. So where the black dots are, I will now put some flat headed screws to hold that piece in place. Because I found that despite the bone grafting, um, it, it just really seems to want to uh, recoil when it's uh, an unstable fragment like that. The other thing is, of course, to keep a lot of cancellous bone on the piece when you do elevate it, like uh, we've tried to do here. This is what that looks like. You can see those flat-headed screws that are actually intracortical, so they're in the bone and the main part of the posterior wall is put down on top of it. These are other alternatives that uh, you're all familiar with, and that's what that looks like. When I use a uh, hook plate, I'll always buttress it with a, uh, uh, a plate 
close to the uh, acetabular margin. So this is what we've talked about. And I think we can go on to uh, a couple of cases that illustrate some additional points. So here's a 62 year old, he's pretty healthy, he fell 12 feet onto concrete, he works as a farmer. And here's his injury film uh, from outside. And here's a CT scan. And here is his uh, 3D reconstruction. So a fairly typical pattern uh, involving both uh, the anterior and posterior column. And uh, I think you can probably see my arrow. This would be on an obturator oblique, the spur. And this piece doesn't have any attached cartilage. So by definition, this is an associated both column. And it's got that typical sort of uh, triangular shaped posterior wall that's hinged here and separated more cranially. So a little bit different, obviously, than a posterior wall that's associated either alone or with a posterior column or with the transverse. So just think about uh, what approach or approaches uh, you might use for that in your uh, practice. And I'll go through my thinking on, on this uh, fracture. So uh, for me, this has a significant anterior column and wall involvement and uh, I will attack, uh, attack these from the front. Um, and uh, so let me, let me just give you my, my preferred approach for, for this. So uh, I create two bundles, the lateral bundle, which is highlighted here in orange, uh, and that contains the lateral uh, femoral cutaneous nerve and the femoral nerve and the iliopsoas. That's, that's one bundle and it's lateral to the iliopecneal fascia and medial to the iliac fossa. The second bundle for me includes the rectus, the artery and vein, and importantly, the genitofemoral nerve, which is a great source of discomfort and neuroma if you uh, ignore it or if you dissect too liberally either medially at the pubic symphysis, you can damage it here, or if you uh, damage it in this area here, it really does bother the patients. The ilioinguinal nerve, of course, is also running down along the inguinal ligament and needs to be identified and protected. But I, I hadn't in my earlier career paid much attention to the genitofemoral nerve and I think created a few unhappy patients with pain. In a male, the pain goes down and radiates into the scrotum and it can be quite disabling actually. So two bundles and three windows are the routine for me. I may or may not develop the middle window in all cases, but here you've got the iliopsoas and the femoral nerve, and here the rectus and the artery and vein, and here the lateral window, the medial window, or sorry, the, 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 the middle window, and here the medial window, or so-called stopa or AIP window. So I develop, uh, in most cases, at least the lateral, and the stop a window, and in many cases, utilize the middle window as well between the two bundles. And uh, for me, the posterior column from the anterior approach, this is my typical go-to clamp placement. Now, the on the sawbone there, the uh, anterior tine of the offset clamp is usually actually over top of the anterior inferior spine, not right on it, as you see there. Uh, and I also use uh, quite frequently the collinear clamp to pull the posterior column up, but I don't use it as it's shown here. I usually have the plate, a J plate already in place and put the clamp on top of the J plate and hooked around the, uh, the in, uh, ischial spine, as you see there. So that would be a very typical for me clamp placement to get the posterior column through the anterior approach. And then the acetabular fixation corridors. Uh, this is uh, my colleague, uh, my colleagues joke about, this is my phase of using only lag screws. I have since abandoned that phase and gone to using buttress plates again. But the idea is that this is the posterior column corridor, the anterior column corridor, the supraacetabular corridor. And this screw, I don't know if it has a name, but I use this quite routinely uh, 
from the anterior inferior spine into the quadrilateral plate to uh, secure that reduction. And then of course, there are additional screws along uh, the uh, crest and so on. But, but these are the, the sort of the standard corridors uh, the suprastabular corridor, also now known as the LC2 screw corridor, that's a newer term that uh, you know we didn't sort of grow up with. But uh, I, I just wanted to point out one additional corridor, and that's the so-called Letternel screw that uh, secures the anterior to the posterior column, but medial to the uh, hip joint. And this was described by Letournel as potentially going through the cotyloid uh, fossa area, but it's still extra articular in the sense that it's not going to uh, damage the femoral head, even if it does enter the cotyloid fossa. A, it's quite caudal, and B, it's deep. The cotyloid fossa is quite uh, thick in that area. Uh, so it would essentially go through the teardrop uh, bone. So this is that case again that we were talking about with those principles in mind. This is the piece of the posterior column that I push on with that uh, clamp. There you see an intraoperative photo where we're trying to do that. And you can see the anterior tine is actually on the outside of the, the pelvis. It's gone through the area between the superior and inferior uh, iliac spine. And uh, uh, that's, that's where it typically sits. This is this is uh, what we call the queen clamp. And I use this quite frequently to push this piece down, especially in a younger patient. I find this is often green stick and difficult to push down. So I will use that clamp behind the gluteus medius pillar on the lateral side, put a, a, a foot on this part and push down that uh, sort of displaced and green stick uh, piece. And uh, I quite like this clamp. Uh, it's not on all the sets anymore, but uh, it is available uh, and, and uh, you know, some, some of us like to use that old clamp. This is what it looks like in the obturator oblique view. You can see the foot there pushing that uh, piece down. The offset clamp, uh, you can see behind the joint there on that posterior column piece, pushing it all in together. And then once you've got it clamped, for me, uh, it's just then uh, utilizing the various corridors. And you can see us here getting ready to put a screw down into the posterior column corridor. And this is the uh, two-year follow-up uh, here. And this is the AP. And these are the oblique views. You can see the, the long cannulated screw is the posterior column. That I put in first, then I take off the clamp, and then I uh, put the screws in on the J-plate. And all of these screws here are linking the anterior and posterior column including the so-called Letronel screw. So in this situation, for me, that's sufficient. I don't add a second plate. I don't add a linked plate. This, uh, for me, uh, com completes the fixation because the quadrilateral plate piece is attached to the posterior column. And when I've reduced the posterior column, that includes a reduction of the quadrilateral plate. Linking the two columns, for me, is enough. I don't find that the, the quadrilateral plate is, is an issue. It doesn't displace when you have this type of a fracture. So, um, you know, for me, the anterior approach uses many or as few windows as you need. For some people, it's like religion. I only do the AIP or I only do the stop or I only do this. I use whatever I think I need and uh, uh, use mostly two windows, uh, but very frequently three windows. And again, from my experience, learn from my uh, early mistakes, uh, watch out for that genitofemoral nerve, uh, or you, you might have a few unhappy patients. We've talked about the clamp placements. And again, you know, the fact that for this particular pattern, I will only use a single plate. So let's look at another fracture here. So this is a fellow that fell off a ladder. And initially, you, you look at this, and it looks very similar to the case we just saw. And, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more, you see a bit of, uh, of a flat line on the cranial uh, cartilage. So that may be a little bit of impaction there. But to me, this is quite a different fracture. And the reason it's quite a different fracture is this piece on the inner side here, 
where the head will tend to displace. Yes, the quadrilateral plate posteriorly is still attached to the posterior column, and I can reduce that with the clamp placement as shown, but this anterior part of the quadrilateral plate and the anterior part of the column is uh, problematic, and I've had patients displaced through that if I haven't added uh, a buttress plate in that area. So again, this is the area that I worry about the head redisplacing into even if I've got the columns linked well. So this is what I've done in this case. And this is a fairly early follow-up. And this was when I was going uh, a few years ago through a phase of letting everybody immediately weight bear. And um, uh, I don't do that anymore. And I'll, I'll just mention why in a minute. But you see here the intrapelvic plate pushing that piece over and this, this screw here, the, the screw in that corridor that I said, I don't really think it has a name, uh, that's to uh, deal with the marginal impaction that we push down and that screw kind of secures that as does this screw from the intrapelvic plate uh, there. So those are the two screws that secure. Remember this looked a bit flat on the initial X-ray and we've, uh, we've tried to reduce and hold that. So again, you know, I use the, the intrapelvic plate really only if the quadrilateral plate is completely separate from the posterior column and I can't link the two, or if there's that anterior comminution. And this patient did well. I, I haven't seen him for a few years, but I have experienced some early failures with immediate weight bearing, especially if there's impaction. And I've reverted back to keeping these patients toe touch weight bearing for eight to 12 weeks. Uh, I, I, I think I've uh, created some uh, issues that I didn't uh, uh, need to uh, deal with and, and had to do some early total hips where I really should have uh, kept them non-weight bearing or toe touch weight bearing. And I don't think the fixation really can prevent, you know, if you've got an impacted piece, you may have buttressed it, but I don't think you can prevent that from re-impacting. It's similar to a tibial plateau or, or any intra-articular fracture uh, I don't let those weight bear either. So uh, just to summarize this first principles talk, the emergency management of an acetabular fracture is really the emergency management of the pelvic ring, reduce dislocations and put traction on if there's cartilage uh, that's in jeopardy, uh, know when to operate. I, we talked about that very briefly in terms of uh, you know, non-operative management of posterior wall fractures. We could have talked about infratectal fractures, and I've got a case of that if it if we get to it in the in the case discussion. Uh, but the the big thing is there is uh, good evidence that the more experience and the more you have a team that is interested in these fractures, as opposed to being a lone wolf, uh, the the better the outcome is. And we've talked a little bit about the different approaches and my rationale for using the Gibson approach for the posterior approach, what I do in the front and, and so on. And uh, uh, again, I hope you learn uh, from my mistakes in terms of the genital femoral nerve and the issue of uh, early immediate weight bearing with some of these fractures. So uh, that's it for the, the, the first principles based talk and I'll stop sharing the screen and uh, I don't know if there's uh, very nice, Dr. Uh, 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 may I? Uh, one of these, uh, these uh, listeners, listeners have asked a question. question. Uh, uh, they want to know. To know. Uh, you have, a, you have a two devices open. You have a two devices open. That's why it is echoing. There's a okay. bit of an echo that because we. Because of can... the two devices logged in together ah. in a one room. Okay. Um, the question is. Uh, yeah. Do you do labral repairs also when there is a small uh, posterior wall fragment? Yeah, so when there's a small posterior wall fragment, uh, you know, uh, that only involves, you know, sort of a very marginal piece or sometimes really only the labrum. I use suture anchors for those and pull the labrum back down that's usually quite a caudal and you might say, well, is that important? And I don't know, but um, Steve Olson did some studies a long time ago where he looked at the, um, the force concentration with just disrupting the labrum, small posterior wall fractures, uh, 
And even a labral disruption or a small posterior wall will change the forces quite a bit because the, the, the head is actually um, really squeezed by the labrum in, in, in the normal circumstance. It's quite tight and you release that tightness and the uh, weight bearing changes quite a bit. Now, the question is, can you replace that by simply repairing the labrum or putting a, a couple of lag screws or buttress plate on? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but um, that's been our current practice to be very, we're very aggressive here with anybody who's had a documented dislocation and often we find little bits of debris in the joint um, to wash that out and, uh, and we fix the posterior wall with either suture anchors for the labrum or the hook plates or leg screws if we can. So that's nice, uh, Professor Hans. We, uh, you had given a very beautiful description of the big, most common posture wall as well as one of the complex injuries of associated both column fracture. Now I got uh, two, three questions. First, you said you are, you have shifted to uh, Gibson approach for the posterior. Is there any indication for cochlear angle back in your practice? Um, I really haven't done uh, a cochlear angle back for quite some time. Uh, but anytime I go prone, I will do a cochlear angle back. And the reason for me to go prone would be, you know, a large person, a heavy person with, uh, so I should cl clarify. So most of my posterior approaches are done in the lateral position. Our patient population here is a lot slimmer and lower weight than our colleagues in the U.S. In the U.S., you, you wouldn't be able to go lateral because, you know, the weight of the patient would simply displace your fracture so they routinely go prone. So when I go prone, I do a cochlear Langenbeck. I don't like doing a prone Gibson. I, I don't think that's a good idea. And when I go prone, that's with a large patient, um, you know, often with a, uh, you know, sort of a T-shaped fracture where I really need to get the anterior column reduced through the notch. And, uh, and the traction is very helpful for that. So when I think I need traction, when I have a large patient, I'll go prone and I'll do a Kocher Langenbeck in that situation. Okay, thank you. Now second, coming over to the anterior approaches, now you have very rightly said that with the literal window of uh, Smith-Peterson and with the IP approach, you get a reasonable amount of an excess. Now, what will be your indications to get into the middle window? Yeah, I, I like the middle window. Uh, remember, Keith Mayo was one of my mentors, and uh, he routinely uses. He usually gives his talk at the uh, at the various pelvic courses. But I like the middle window uh, for the letternel screw. I don't think I can do it as easily. You know, you have to take the rectus quite lateral to get to that spot, and I do it by putting my finger into the obturator uh, a frame, and I happen to have a pelvis here, so. I'll put my finger right in this area here uh, to do the screw and then uh, uh, with a drill on oscillate, you know, oscillate it right next to my finger. The other, um, I, I will often use the offset clamp through the middle window uh, over the edge to get the anterior part of a, a quadrilateral uh, plate reduction. So I sometimes have two offset clamps, one through the lateral window and one through the middle window to get that. And fairly commonly, you saw when I added the second plate, I will put a short angled clamp through the middle window on top of the plate to pull that, that you know, anterior comminuted piece laterally and, and keep it held while I put the screws in to that interpelvic plate. So those are the most common reasons I use the middle window. But you're absolutely right. You can, you know, and, and Claude Saji, who, uh, you know, sort of popularized the AIP approach, he, he'll take down, you know, part of the uh, crest and the inguinal ligament and get quite caudal. And, you know, you can mobilize the rectus quite lateral. But uh, as opposed, so, uh, you know, for me, as opposed to really retracting the tissues uh, aggressively, I'll just, do that middle window. And now that we don't create a separate bundle medial to the vessels, you know, I keep the rectus in that bundle. I don't see the problems with uh, swelling and with uh, 
you know, disruption of the lymphatic uh, uh, structures, which are in that area that we used to dissect in the original approach, you would dissect those. Now we don't do that anymore. Okay. Dr. Professor Crader, I have one question. Posterior dislocation, fracture dislocation, reduced and uh, clinically it is stable and uh, fragment is medium, medially, medium size fragment. Still you fix it or treat conservatively? So uh, I think your practices are, from what I understand, a little bit different than mine. Remember, I get mine you know, day one. They, they injure, they come here, you know? So I have treated two patients non-operatively for posterior wall fractures, both of whom presented to me late. And I think, as I understand it, uh, many times, you know, you have a bone setter or somebody, uh, you know, in the community, and you might see those patients at a couple of weeks. And then I think, you know, you have to balance. Uh, uh, so for me, the, the two patients that I treated non-operatively, one was a very burly, heavy set uh, police officer, actually. And he had been injured and he really didn't seek any medical attention and had some pain. And two weeks later he came and he actually had a fairly sizable posterior wall piece. Uh, but this was at two weeks out, he'd been walking on it. Uh, you know, he hadn't, hadn't any complaints other than a bit of pain. So I took him to the operating room and did an examination under full anesthetic and he was stable. So I couldn't justify operating on that. Uh, and the other one was actually a young lady that had been uh, injured and uh, she's from a, quite a remote community and they had treated her there, the local orthopedic surgeon non-operatively and then had sent her to me for an opinion because she had ongoing pain at six weeks. But you know, at six weeks, things were already partially healed and uh, she actually did quite well. So maybe I'm operating on too many, but the ones that I see early uh, you know, um, we, we do fix, but uh, certainly, you know, Paul Trinetta and others have good evidence to suggest that those can be treated non-operatively, but it, it's, it's probably a bit of a, a quirk of our, our practice here. Sir, there is another situation where there is a posterior fracture location. It is reduced, it is stable, but many times a small piece gets intraarticular and you do not get completely concentric reduction then uh, you have to open up. That is right. I, I, yeah, I agree completely. And, and there's old literature. Remember that old paper from Evans in the 90s where, you know, he operated on all of these and 100% had some intraarticular debris, but that was really almost before CT scan was so easily available. And, and you know, hopefully you can see the, the debris to some degree, but it's always bigger in real life than it looks on the CT. And the CT, you think it's a small little piece, but it's always, it's got big soft piece. tissues and car, it's always bigger than it looks. With the capsule, it goes in uh, while during the- Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Professor Crater, do you try to reduce the dome impaction through the ileum, making a separate window or through the fracture itself medially? What would you prefer? So, two, two sort of separate situations, um, usually not by creating a window, although sometimes that's necessary. So usually I can see it through the uh, stopper, the, we'll call it the stopper window, but uh, through that window, you can see the impaction and get a, a, a device and push it down. But then I always struggle with how to hold it. So <laughs> once I've got it pushed down, I put some K wires in and I put those in from the anterior inferior spine area uh, into the piece. And, and, and the problem is that sometimes, uh, you know, if you put it in too far, then you prevent the reduction of the quadrilateral plate piece. But uh, I can also sometimes get it from the pelvic brim uh, caudally. Uh, but I, I struggle, I can get it reduced almost all the time but then I struggle to hold it. And if you have any tricks, I'd be happy to, to have them shared with me because right now I'm using K-wires and it's a little bit flexible and it's not ideal, but uh, uh, you know, and so the other technique, you know, you might say, well, why don't you reduce the columns and then make a little window and tamp it down? I've done that as well, but uh, you know, I don't have a 3D CT scan in the operating room. We just rely on fluoro, and it always looks beautiful on fluoro. Uh, 
but in the few times where I've done that, and then I said, I, I, I'm just not so happy. Let's open up the column again. It's still quite displaced. So if you don't see the reduction, you know, and you're just relying on fluoro through a window, I don't, I don't, in my own hands, I haven't been as successful in reducing it, uh, you know, when I've looked at it again, <laughs> opening the column, it's still displaced. So I, I do it under direct vision and try to hold it and then close the columns, but it's very difficult. Uh, so you said that you fix that uh, by screws, that black dots you are saying. That is 2.4 converted screws? Or uh, so yes, uh, the posterior wall impaction you're talking about, where I yeah, throw yeah. the two black dots. Yeah, those are uh, any flat-headed screw, you know, uh, two fours, or, or even two millimeter screws, uh, but be careful. I've had one patient, uh, he presented and he was fine. Uh, and uh, he was, we usually have them come back at one year and two years. So he came back for his two year follow up. He says, I'm fine, you know, and we did, we do our pelvic questionnaire and we did his x-rays and the screws had migrated right through. Those were two millimeter screws right through the, the bone and were sitting in his pelvis. And I, you know, I'd never seen that before, but, uh, you know, like anything, they can, they're little, the smaller they are. So I've since then gone to bigger screws. So, you know, in the early days, it was all really, I wanted to get them as far away from the articular cartilage as possible. So I used two millimeter screws. The longest screw is 24. So I put those in. Now I go with the bigger screws because I don't think they're going to migrate because uh, I've had that one case where they just simply migrated right through the bone and into the pelvis. He, he's happy, I haven't taken them out, but I worry a little bit about where they might go, you know. Can you pass the fragmentary tip or arthroscopy if the tip is stable? That's one question. I have a second question also. Since you come into fractures, that is typically in geriatrics, you always I'm sorry, there's a lot of um, echo again. Dr. Lokesh, again, there are two devices are open, two, yeah. uh, two uh, communications. Don't keep two communication in one room. Yeah. Two, sorry, two, sound, two sound devices will uh, make that. this problem. I Close one, yeah, yeah. Make one mute. Make one mute, please. Yeah. So now you can I, ask. Uh, do you prefer to do a hip arthroscopy if the hip is stable, number one? Number two, in uh, severely comminuted fractures like in geriatrics, um, would you still, what is your threshold to do a hip replacement versus uh, fixing? So that's a whole, that, that's one of, that's the next presentation the next for the yeah. geriatric. But I don't do hip arthroscopy. We have some sports people that do that and I have no experience. So I really can't comment on hip arthroscopy at all. Sir, how much is the difficulty when there is a fat lady with the two caesarean sections has been done and there are two scars already of the caesarean section to open up anteriorly? Yeah, so, uh, you know, <laughs> we don't get as many uh, of those, but usually if they're, I, I sort of differentiate between two types of large people. So there are the large people that are really not very muscular, you know, and there, you know, you can retract things. There's a lot of things to retract, but you can usually get the access. You know, I call those more loose tissue. You know, they're, they're large, but they're very loose tissue. And then there are the muscular people. You know, the muscular guy who's got a big belly, but it's all muscle. And those for me are the more difficult ones. And uh, the, uh, the most difficult case that I can remember was uh, a patient, he had uh, a, a condition, a syndrome, and he uh, was 562 pounds. That's large by any standard, even US standards and certainly by Canadian standards, but he was also very tall and um, he had a T-type acetabular fracture. And so um, that's the type of fra patient that I would try to do things from posterior as opposed to going to the front. And so him, I did, uh, we didn't do him prone, we did him lateral because you can't put him prone. Uh, we used two tables. One table had the belly, the panis, and the other table, the, the body. And uh, we used traction and, and so on. But we don't see, you, you may have more experience with those than I do, but I will try to stay away from doing an anterior approach if 
the patient is so large because I find it very difficult. What about the caesarean sections, previous caesarean sections? Oh, we don't worry about those so much. We have a lot of patients, you know, we have a clinic here, the Shouldice Clinic that does sort of a, a, a hernia repair that's biologic. Uh, and, and then we have repairs with mesh. I, I, I'll just cut through that. I, I don't worry too much about the caesarean sections. You know, you can usually mobilize the rectus still. Uh, at least that's been my experience. What I do warn the patients is that if they've had any sort of phenogeal incision, cesarean section or otherwise, you know, maybe for a bladder, that we might rupture their bladder. And I have gotten into the bladder a couple of times. And in the early days, uh, I was very excited about that and called the urologist to repair. Now, I, I, it's easy to repair yourself. Two layers, closure, cat gut on the inside, and then some Vicryl on the outside and, and it's not a big deal. But I do warn them if they have that scar down there that they might have to have a catheter for a prolonged period of time because you can damage the bladder for sure. Yeah, Professor, uh, I think we'll move with the next talk because uh, we are short of time. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Let me uh, uh, share the screen. Let me make sure I have the other talk. All right. You will need to share the screen again. Yeah, sorry. I'm just uh, pulling up the correct talk uh, here. I had the wrong one open. There we go. Uh, and there, that should be, uh, should be it now. Oh, sorry, the wrong talk again. Let me close that. And this one. Okay, um, I hope you can all see the screen. It should be the talk on when to consider combined. Yes, yes, we are, we are seeing it, sir. So that's exactly the question that was asked. So <clears throat> this is all case-based. So. Um, let's go through this. So this is a 51 year old male who is scheduled for a left total hip replacement at an outside institution. He's not my patient. And he uh, had a recent right total hip replacement and was involved in a car crash. So here you can see the uh, left uh, hip. It's got obvious arthritis. He's got a significant injury there. And here's his CT scan. The right is also in need of some attention and the left side uh, is already arthritic. So I don't think there's much debate. <clears throat> you know, if he's already needing a total hip, why not do one? And, and this is what we did here. But uh, this is a rare situation. More often we have a, a more borderline situation. So this is a 79 year old lady and she is on long-term prednisone. So she has poor quality bone and she uses a cane, <clears throat> excuse me, in her right hand to walk. And unfortunately, three weeks prior to presenting, she broke her shoulder, her left shoulder, which was okay because she can still use the cane in her right hand. But uh, now she presents with this right-sided acetabular fracture. And uh, the question is, what would you do with that? And uh, let's just go through this in a bit of an organized fashion. So. Uh, the goals for this session are to sort of think about the variables that are associated with fixation failure and then to be able to plan a management strategy that includes immediate total hip replacement. And then just to, I wanted to review a bit of the literature on the risk because I think people overestimate the risk, uh, at least in, in, in this area, uh, what the risk is of a combined fixation and total hip. And you might say, well, what about non-operative treatment? So uh, we use that in, in somebody who's palliative, you know, they're, they're very sick or they're non-ambulatory. But the problem is, uh, you know, most of these patients have unstable fractures. I, I guess you could say if there's a secondary congruence with an associated both column and the hip stable, uh, but in our experience here, at least, that's quite rare. And if you're thinking about non-operative treatment and then planning for a later total hip anyway, you know, in a patient that's not moribund or where you're, you're not planning for a later total hip, you're just planning on non-operative treatment. But, you know, some people say, well, I'll treat them non-operatively and then I'll do a hip replacement later. Well, 
you know, you have to get the patient up. And uh, if you leave them in bed while you're waiting for things to heal, that's not very good for the patient. And most of these are quite painful, at least uh, if they're unstable fractures. And, you know, then you're treating an elderly patient with lots of pain medications and they're having difficulty moving. And you might say, well, if you're planning a hip replacement anyway, why wouldn't you do it now? Uh, and the usual comment that I hear is, well, it's too complicated or it's really risky. So one of the things I wanted to do is just sort of quantify the risk. And these are some uh, fairly, uh, I think, good comprehensive uh, uh, papers that sort of look at the risk of combined fixation and total hip replacement. The mortality, and these are elderly patients, you know, it's not going to be zero, it's, uh, it's but it's probably uh, low. <clears throat> the infection risk is there, up to 10% in some studies. Uh, dislocation risk, up to 10%. And heterotopic bone is something that uh, I think is, is a problem, and it's as much as 40%. But, you know, it's, is, it, is it so risky? Well, uh, you know, I mean, there is risk, but it's not maybe as risky as people thought it was. So let's look at uh, a case here. This is a 66 year old male. He's not that healthy. He's had a prior uh, CVA as uh, a stroke, uh, myocardial. So he's had a heart attack and a stroke, but he's living independently at home. And he has this fracture on the left. And uh, you can see there's your day views. And here is uh, you know, this, uh, this sign that we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, he's got some true impaction here of the femoral head. As you can see, there's a little bit of a chunk out of the femoral head. And this is the very typical location of, in an associated both column fracture, the cranial and posterior area. There's often a bit of impaction right there where you see the arrow pointing to. Very, very common. So he's got a little bit of that. And, uh, you know, let's, are those, are those risk factors for fixation failure? Well, from the literature, we know that the inability to get a, a, an anatomic reduction and maintain it is a risk factor for fixation failure. And a lot of that is related to surgeon experience, bone quality, femoral head or neck injury, and true impaction of the weight-bearing cartilage. And this is what I'd like to focus on because I think that there's some, um, at least in my experience, confusion about this. So this is that patient and Jeff Anglin has described the gall wing sign and uh, said it's a bad prognostic indicator, but I think many people are misinterpreting the gall wing. And uh, here uh, is my thought on this. If you see curved cartilage that's displaced out of the way, it may in fact not be true impaction. And all you have to do is put that curved piece of cartilage back where it belongs and it, it'll it be fine. So here's a, a situation where that's the case. Here's that area that looks like it's a gall wing and it's not true impaction. You can see it here through the uh, three-dimensional looking through the other uh, sciatic notch and seeing that that's really just a piece of normal articular cartilage. It's not impacted, it's curved, it matches the femoral head. All that has to be done is to replace it back to where it should be. That's the piece that you're looking at. That's not the impacted area. The impacted area is that cranial and posterior area and it's not that bad. So this is what you're looking at. You're looking at a piece that's displaced it's creating that gall wing appearance and all you have to do is push it down and the gall wing will go away. So that's uh, the case again. You see the little bit of impaction, you see the head impaction. Um, and you know, my impression was that this was not a high risk for fixation failure. And I fixed this patient. I last saw him at seven years. It's been uh, quite a few years since then. And you can see again, the hopefully, uh, strategically placed screws to, to deal with that posterior and cranial impaction and a fairly limited sort of fixation. The femoral head notch is still there, but this picture is taken at seven years and uh, he's, he was still doing fine at that point. So uh, to me, the gull wing is not necessarily a sign of impaction. 
it's a sign of displaced cartilage for sure, but it often is uh, not a bad prognostic uh, finding. So again, I used a single J plate here, and we've talked about that before, and delayed weight bearing, we've talked about that before as well. So let's look at another case. This is a 76-year-old female, and she was struck by a motor vehicle. So she's elderly, but this was a high energy injury. She's got a, a GCS of six. She has a, an atlantoaxial dissociation, flail chest, humerus fracture. So she's a true trauma victim. And here is her x-ray here in the trauma bay. And as opposed to the gull wing sign, she's got a flat articular cartilage. And um, I don't know if anybody's written about this and anybody who's uh, participating, you're welcome to write this up. Uh, I call this the flat line. And a flat line is never uh, normal. You know, cartilage around the uh, femoral head should be curved. So if you see a flat line, that's always, in my experience, true impaction. And here it is here. You see the area that's flat. It's truly impacted up there. There's no sort of cortex uh, beyond it. And the same, you know, this, this didn't appear on that AP, but you can see the same area of cranial and posterior impaction that we all deal with. So that to me is true impaction. You've got this situation. And to get rid of that impaction, you have to get a chisel or something in there and push it down. Very different than what you see with the typical gall wing. So this is that patient here. And, uh, you know, you might think, okay, well, what are we going to do with this one? This is a sick patient. Um, she's got true impaction. So in red are the bad things. Uh, she's older and really bad quality bone. She's got extensive impaction of that weight bearing surface. Her femoral head looked pretty good on the CT scan, but my uh, thought on her was uh, we need to get her up. She's a multi-trauma patient and I need to get this uh, patient to a point where she can be weight bearing and activity is tolerated immediately. So I plan to do fixation and a total hip replacement. And it's the easiest fixation you'll ever do. I don't use fluoro for these. I do use a radiolucent table just in case. And you know, you might ask it, well, if you don't use fluoro, why use a radiolucent table? And it, I, I don't know, I, I could probably do it on a regular table, but I do use the radiolucent table just in case. And I use however many windows I want, uh, usually just one or two. Uh, but uh, you can do whatever you need to do. And the intrapelvic plate, that second plate, again, I don't use that in all cases, but I will not hesitate to use that to anchor the cup a little bit better. I use an uncemented cup with screws. My fixation for this anterior pattern is anterior, so I do an anterior approach to the total hip and immediate weight bearing. This was described by Joel Mata, who was one of the first to uh, talk about this. And uh, uh, I, I am just nervous about using such limited fixation. So uh, I use a longer plate like you see here and I anchor it medially. So this is uh, this case, and this would be fairly typical for what I do. Um, in this case, I did use a second plate and uh, I anchor the screw with, or the, the cup with multiple screws. And almost always in these older patients, a cemented stem. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, you, you can use an uncemented stem if the patient bone quality affords it, but I almost always go to a, a cemented stem. So those are the anterior patterns that we've talked about. And uh, we should, uh, for completeness sake, talk about the posterior patterns too. And I think they're, they're quite different. So here's a 73 year old gentleman who was out hiking and uh, hunting. And uh, here is his uh, initial presenting x-ray. He presented to us, the residents nicely reduced that. So it looks a lot better now, but here's the CT scan. And he's got marginal impaction. He's got femoral head involvement and he's got a fragmented a posterior wall, and uh, it, it might even extend into the posterior column, which posterior wall, posterior column combinations, for me at least, are very challenging uh, in the best of times, and certainly in this uh, sort of age group with poor quality bone. So I think he's got all the bad risk factors, and um, 
for him, the, the plan was a total hip. So the strategy is a little bit different, obviously. Uh, I do a Coker Langenbeck or a Gibson. Again, for me, it's a Gibson, but you know, you can do whatever uh, approach you, you wish. And um, I don't do posterior total hips. Uh, many of you might think this is uh, very, uh, uh, very easy. For me, it's, it's not that familiar because I don't do a posterior total hip replacement, but I've learned to make sure you take the, just like you who do the posterior total hip, uh, take the rotators and the capsule off the femur and peel that all back as a continuous layer uh, because I have early on had some instability, probably because my lack of familiarity with the posterior approach. Minimize stripping of the posterior wall. And the next point is, I think, very critical. Uh, put a lag screw in that posterior wall piece, uh, not just a buttress plate, because as you're putting the reamer in and pulling the reamer out, if there's nothing securing that posterior wall piece, you might have a buttress plate there, but it'll just flip in to the hole and flip out in your in your wound. Uh, and, and so I had that happen. And uh, if you put a couple of lag screws in to hold that piece in place as you're reaming uh, and pulling the reamer in and out, that won't happen. So that's... Uh, what I've learned and and total hip, you can do whatever you like. In this case, I think we did uh, uncemented total hip uh, and he was back hiking and weight bearing is tolerated immediately back at hiking at three months. So, uh, and there are the Jude views <clears throat> there. So uh, just to summarize uh, this, uh, we know from the literature and, and from, you know, our own experience that uh, older age and poor bone qual quality is a high risk uh, factor for fixation failure. If you've got extensive involvement of the femoral head or neck, and if the hip was dislocated, uh, especially, you know, posterior dislocation, uh, wall comminution and true impaction of the weight bearing surface, that's the dome or posterior wall. So for me, that's a flat line or you know, the typical marginal impaction of a posterior wall. I think there's some controversy about uh, weight bearing after just fixation. As I said, I've reverted back for not, not total hip, I'm just talking about just fixation. Uh, I delay weight bearing on those, especially if there's been a bit of impaction that I've reduced. And there's some controversy regarding the outcome of fixation and total hip. And you can see that in the literature, there's quite a range from zero to 10% of you know, um, uh, certain complications and 10 to 40% of heterotopic bone. But I don't think the complication risk is as high as we initially thought. There's a perception that it's really hard to do the anterior patterns. And I think that's probably not the case. And there's a perception that the posterior wall patterns to do a combined fixation and total hip are really easy. And I think that's probably not the case either. I think, you know, they're they're both uh, they both need to to have careful attention to detail. So again, that's uh, 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 my experience. Uh, this is a review that uh, was done by Andy Schmidt, and uh, this is an American Academy um, uh, webinar that we did some some years ago. And again, the treatment recommendation is that most of these elderly patients with fragility fractures still deserve fixation and can be expected to do reasonably well uh, if it's done with careful attention to detail. Um, so I don't want you to get the impression that I uh, treat, you know, uh, the, the majority of these with total hip replacement. It's really the minority. I'd say, you know, the vast majority of these fragility fractures we fix and they tend to do pretty well. So that's it for, for that. I'll stop screen sharing and happy to entertain any any thoughts from you or, or question. I have a question regarding what is the observation we have in elderly that in patients who get ABC fractures, we don't get a true impaction. We get impaction in those patients where we have got AC post anterior coronal posterior hemitransfers. And eventually, Keeping that as an uh, indication, these elderly, most of those cases tend to get in for a replacement and anterior column uh, and ABC fractures tend to be settled otherwise by fixation. I, I mean, it's just an observation, we have got it. Complete. Now the question, yeah, I just want to know how often you had to change your option on the table from reconstruction to a replacement. 
I I've not done that. I I I know you're you're asking. You know, uh, you get in there and it's worse than you think. I, I spend a lot of time, and and we're lucky. We have a group of of uh, people here, and any difficult case, we we bounce around. We'll we'll look at it as a team. We look at it together. We look at it with the fellows, and we think about it a lot. So uh, usually, when we go to the operating room, we we have our plan and. Uh, for, for me, I've not changed midstream, to be honest. I've never taken a patient and said, oh my God, it's worse than I thought. We better do a total hip. Um, so that, that hasn't happened yet. But uh, I think uh, that's just basically because we really think about these as a group. You know, it's not just me. It's not just Dave Steven or Richard Jenkinson. We all look at them together and uh, come up with a plan. So we haven't had to do that yet. And then there is a related thing which you have partly told that once the reconstruction is done, you are not putting them on weight bearing initially for six to eight years if we talk about a full weight bearing. But a person who is elderly enough and if you are getting him out of the bed, he may not be able to understand what is partial loading or partial weight bearing. So what is the level of ambulation you permit to a patient who has got a pure fixation exactly and who has got a replacement done along with it actually factors into my decision making now. And, uh, you know, we went through a phase, uh, the three of us who do the pelvic work here, where we, you know, sort of said, look, you know, we should get these uh, elderly that we fix weight bearing right away. And we've all had some failures. So we backed off. So now it factors into my decision making. So I'll give you an example. I, I have this case uh, on the computer, but um, a, a gentleman who is blind, he fell over his seeing eye dog and he had uh, an anterior plus posterior hemitransverse. So, you know, the typical fracture, not much impaction, less than even the case that I showed where the femoral head was notched and we fixed him. And I think he would have done well with fixation, but he did have a little bit of impaction. And, uh, you know, I'd had the experience of having failures with the immediate weight bearing. So I talked to him and I said, look, you know, we could fix you, but you know, you're blind, you live alone. It, it means that you be in rehab in a wheelchair, you know? Uh, and he said, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, and we did a total hip on him for the only reason that I didn't think he could comply with uh, safe, limited weight bearing. And I've done that a few times since then. And uh, so it does now factor into my decision-making. If I think they're too frail or too cognitively um, impaired to be toe touch weight bearing, I'll, I'll just do a total hip on them. Can I ask the question, sir? Uh, you have shown that in the osteoporotic bone, you're getting a full span uh, of the longer plates you are using. Where, where is the indication for use uh, two plates? Because you, you usually favor only one plate. Yeah, so it's similar to when I fix the uh, fractures, you know, without total hip replacement. I use the similar criteria. Um, so if the quadrilateral plate is completely dissociated from the posterior column piece, and if the anterior part, because you might say, well, you're going to put a, a, a cup in, you're going to anchor it with screws, and you're probably right. I, I'm just being overly cautious, I think. So I will add the intrapelvic plate if that anterior comminution is there, and I don't think I can, you know, uh, prevent the cup from potentially twisting, you know, rotating in into the pelvis. Uh, but uh, many of my colleagues, uh, you know, will just use a, a, a single plate or, or even just a short plate like Joel Mata showed, you know. So I, I just, uh, I like to get them up fully weight bearing without any concern. And uh, I, I had one that I inherited from a colleague who had uh, uh, fixed uh, the, 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 with just a single plate and put in a cup and uh, the cup rotated. And uh, so all I did in that case was I added the intrapelvic plate and I was able to push the cup back out and anchor it and add a few more screws to the cup. And we didn't have to do a big, big revision. But uh, so I think we're all, you know, um, we do things based on complications that we've had or that we've seen. And, and so I'm a little bit more aggressive with that intrapelvic plate than, than some might be for that reason. 
Sir, can I can I can I get can we get the input from the doctor? May say, sir, he has designed one good plate for the quadrilateral fragment. So how does it help in that situation? Yeah, my perception is that when I studied a lot about these osteoporotic fractures, and when we were looking for it, the classical all the biomechanics says that the osteoporotic fracture must have reason uh, plate must have a adequate uh, support to the areas of combination. So uh, the just like I had a different perspective than the classical plates which are made as a this thing. Either the plates are on the superior surface or on the medial surface with a link between the two. My perception was different that rather than looking at two aspects, why not to stabilize at the brim level? So I have a plate which stabilizes the fracture at the brim, which is at forty-five degree, and it is able to take care of both the vectors of the injury, which is going superior medially. So that way, I personally feel it. Once you put that plate over the brim, it gives much more stable configuration, and the fixation is likely to stay even with the osteoporotic bone. That was one point. Second point is that whenever you are putting a screw from up down in an osteoporotic bone, the screws may not have much of the strength. You cannot put many screws from medial to lateral side to give a stability. But when you put an oblique plate from the brim. the screws are not going down they are not they are actually getting over to the outer cortex so you get a mm. dual cortical purchase in that kind of a plate and third thing which i have devised in this plate is that from inside with a specific screw which is just supra estabular a nut will go outside and on the gay wire from outside you'll put a bolt on it and both will be compressed so when both are compressed your plate gives a very sturdy look in the supra estabular area so that construct is much better in that poor quality bone of the elderly also so this is the concept which i have put up in the plate yeah no i think that's excellent uh we can't get any bolts you know i, I i've tried so you know we we aren't talking about it today but i've had failures with excellent i think screws going transacral at the back and you know i'm trying to get a company to sell me a bolt that i can put on the other side because you know in that in that weak bone at the transacral screws they loosen you know with the especially with the elderly you want to get them mobilized quickly and nobody seems to have one here in north america um so <laughs> it, it, and in fact you know i mean uh, you're fortunate uh, uh, i think in your country sometimes uh, here they threaten to stop making the angle blade plate you know the osteotomy plates in the angle i said well look i'll i'll have to talk to my colleagues in india because i know their manufacturers there and you can send it to me in north america but they <laughs> they relented but i i think that makes a lot of sense you know i mean to use a bolt uh, so that you get bicortical fixation in osteoporotic bone that's a, it's it makes good sense and um, i have no experience with the link plate you know there's a company and and i guess we shouldn't be too we should be a little bit careful but there's a company that makes a link plate here in north america and i suspect your plate is a little bit different and you know for me their particular plate i've struggled with because i i i you know you you either get the one plate in the right place or the other plate and and so i i'm sure your plate is more more care makes good sense sir there is a question from dr professor magu is a very senior oh, orthopedic yes, surgeon I, and pelvic yes. acetabular surgeon yes we have he met asks, he is yeah. asking you what is your experience with vascular accidents while operating acetabular fractures if you come across the external iliac vein injury after you open through the stopa approach what you do you repair or leave it as such what the ask i will you you will never you have i've never surgeon. had any problems i wish that were the <laughs> you know anybody who uh, operates on the front of the pelvis will have those vascular situations and uh, you know so we try to two things we try to prepare for them and uh, the second thing is i'm very lucky in my hospital uh, we have vascular surgeons who can be there like that and i i've had to call on them uh, numerous times over the years so um you know and it's always it's the vein you know the artery you you can usually you know uh, stop the bleeding it's the vein that that really gets you and and i've learned that the wrong thing to do is to start cauterizing the vein because you just make the hole bigger and bigger and 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 a disaster so uh if i do it if i damage it and 
the the it's both anterior and posterior you know i mean there are the situations as you all know the the vein and the artery go along the brim and you can you can damage it uh, there but often in an associated both column fracture you know the medialization actually captures sometimes even the nerve and the vessels and as soon as you shoehorn that medial piece back under the vein gets torn and it bleeds like crazy so uh, all that i do is i just pack, 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 and ask for the vascular surgeon. We haven't uh, had to, you know, and it's usually the vein, uh, uh, and, and, you know, they deal with it. Uh, I, you know, as I said, I, I, if I do the stop approach only, um, it, it, that's pretty rare. That would be for a very specific type of fracture. I almost always do at least two windows. And so I have at least the lateral window accessible and it doesn't take long to add the middle window if you need to uh, access uh, something that you've torn in that area. So for me, uh, you know, the lateral and, and uh, stop a window are always open and uh, adding the middle window is, is not a big deal. But I, you know, I, I don't have any uh, special tricks other than calling my colleagues from vascular surgery and packing. I've not had to take a patient to the operating room with an acetabular fracture for an arterial or, or for, to the angio suite for an arterial injury yet, but I have had the situation a couple of times where I've taken, uh, the last one was a very dramatic one where a burn patient had extensive heterotopic bone and I was dissecting posteriorly, being very careful, you know, but still got into just tremendous significant bleeding from branches of the superior gluteal and the vascular surgeon couldn't control uh, either so we sent that patient to angiography but mostly with the acetabular and pelvic surgery in my experience it's the vein and the uh, vascular surgeons are much more gentle they bring their loops and big suckers and you know they they uh, we usually have the cell saver so you know Usually that blood is recycled so that uh, it's not a huge uh, blood loss. But uh, I, I'd, I'd welcome Dr. Magoo, uh, who, who I've had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, if he has any any thoughts or insights, I'd, I'd welcome if he could share them because I that, that's basically... I, I, I'm waiting. If he's getting any contribution, I'm waiting <laughs> in the WhatsApp. One, one. Wow. Professor Crater, uh, is there any role for locking plates in geriatric stabular fractures? So, you know, uh, my colleague, Dave Stephen, and I uh, disagree on this one. He would say yes, I would say no. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, nothing is ever hard and fast. Uh, and, and I don't use them. Uh, he will use them occasionally. And his thought is that he will put, you know, a regular screw in. And then if it doesn't get a purchase, he will use uh, a locking screw. Uh, I, 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 so I think there is a role. I personally don't use it, but I think there is a role, and uh, uh, and and he would have more experience with that than, than me. So thank you, Prof. So we shall go with the next yeah. session. Okay. So the last session is just some cases to hopefully illustrate some points. But please, uh, I know that uh, my colleagues uh, have some cases too. And for me, it's always interesting to see other people's cases. But uh, So please interrupt any time. Um, how much time would you like me to? It's 9 o'clock my time now. Uh, we'll have around 20 minutes to 30 minutes. 30 minutes? OK. Uh, so why don't you, I'll set a little timer. But please interrupt me any time, because you know, I just uh, put many cases in. The first few have some specific points, hopefully, to illustrate. But uh, I don't want to use the whole time. I think uh, uh, I'd be keen to to hear your cases and, and your experience uh, and, and share your thoughts. OK, so I will uh, do the case presentation. Uh, It'll take me a second. I just have to end the previous show. And all right. Uh, let 
Yeah, desktop. Okay. Oh, keeps coming back with that one for some reason. Uh, let me just try that again. Cases, okay. There we go, that should be it, yes. I apologize, I, I had, no, it keeps coming up with this one. What is the problem with that? Let me, uh, <laughs> let me uh, close that one completely. That's the tabular cases. Desktop. Well, there goes our 30 minutes, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, let me just make sure. Oh, I see. I had the wrong talk there. So let me just pull it up. India webinar. Oh, I see, it's just mislabeled. Okay, it is just mislabeled in the title. Apologies, uh, I just had the wrong label on the title slide. Okay, uh, here we are. So uh, this is uh, first case here. And uh, the objectives for this particular case are uh, you know, to again go over some emergency management and, and just some, this is a variant of a common uh, fracture um, and just the, the categorization. So this is a sick patient, 25 year old uh, uh, young lady, and she's sick, she's uh, been struck. And here is her initial x-ray. So I'll just give uh, the participants and my colleagues a, a minute just to look at that. And um, she's uh, got many, uh, she's a multiple trauma patient. She's uh, uh, quite sick to the point where we have to think about doing some damage control. So uh, we uh, had wrapped her in a pelvic sheet and uh, she had gone to the interventional radiology. That's what IR stands for, angiography, and there was nothing to embolize. And she uh, has a uh, brain hemorrhage uh, internal carotid artery dissection, injury to her opposite carotid artery. She's got uh, abdominal wall blowout and, and this pelvic injury. And I'll just uh, sort of go through this here and uh, just pay attention to, the, to this part because part of the objective of this particular case is to learn from my mistake. So I think you can see the uh, SI joint there is disrupted and she's in a sheet at this point. And here is the acetabular fracture. And here is the opposite sided uh, pubic ramus fracture. And uh, we'll go to the couple of uh, specific cuts. And I think you can see again, the posterior yes. SI joint injury and the uh, acetabular fracture there. And uh, the next, uh, so, you know, what we did emergently is we cut some holes in the sheet and put an X fix on. I, I still like uh, in the emergency situation, this was uh, part of a, a code orange, which is when there are multiple casualty victims. And so we still use a sheet in those situations because we don't have enough pelvic binders. So this is what she looks like now. And uh, remember the acetabular fracture is on the left and the SI joint that you saw in the original CT scan is on the right. And uh, just look, uh, look at those two views and you can see where, you know, you're, you're smarter than I am. And, and I made a mistake in managing this patient, which you probably won't uh, since I pointed it out, but she's young in my defense, she's a young patient. Uh, uh, you can see that she's got some sacral dysmorphism there, especially on the outlet view, that's easy to see. 
Here are the Jade views uh, showing you her acetabular fracture, and she's now stable. And uh, here is uh, I'll take you through the uh, 3D, um, the 3D uh, image here. So this goes fairly quickly. So I'll slow it down a little bit. But you can see there, there's volume averaging, right? But you saw on the coronal that this is really a transverse fracture. And uh, you can see here that it's volume averaged out at the back, which is uh, interesting. You know, so this is a transverse. It does go through all the way to the back. But you can see here that the anterior aspect of the transverse is more displaced than the posterior aspect. And so in my experience, that's commonly the case when you've got the opposite side of pubic ramus. So the issue of pubic segment is this whole piece here. This whole piece is the caudal or issue pubic segment. And in my experience, when that includes the opposite side, the anterior part of the transverse is uh, more displaced than the posterior part, which it is here, clearly. So. I don't know. I mean, uh, normally when we present this uh, live, we would, you know, sort of have a discussion. We don't have have time to do that. But uh, basically, I identified the right SI joint. You know, I saw that on the initial CT scan. The left, uh, I think it's a transtectal. You can see that on the coronal cuts. This goes through the weight bearing part, and then the opposite uh, rami. So it's a transverse. And does anybody see anything else? And, and hopefully you've, you've seen that the left SI joint is also involved. And I missed that. I confess I missed it. And so what would you do? What order would you do this in? Would you do the pelvis first? Would you do the acetabulum first? And so to me, these combined injuries, it depends on what is going to be constraining what. In general, you work from back to front. But to me, this one, you know, this is mobile here on the opposite side. The transverse to me requires something to, to pull it together in the front. And I can do that easier from the front than the back. And I can also help by guiding this opposite side up a little bit to help with a transverse. So to me, this was an anterior approach, starting with the acetabular fracture, lifting this up, then doing the posterior right SI joint, and then finally fixing the, the ramus on that side, but having the ramus exposed so that I could help with the reduction of the transverse. Now, that, that was sort of my strategy for this particular fracture. So that's what we did. Number one was the acetabular fracture here from the front. Number two was the right SI joint. Number three was this. And this is her uh, post-operative film. This is what her inlet and outlet views look like. And look at that left SI joint. Huh? You see how open that is? Right SI joint looks pretty good, but I, I should have reduced and fixed this joint. Now, I got away with it because there was enough mobility here. But the point is, and look at the inlet view here. So she's now, I think, um, uh, is it three years? I think she's three years out now. And this screw, I don't have the picture, but this screw is broken here and she has some left-sided SI joint pain. And that could have been prevented if I had done what we should always do is assess both SI joints and pay careful attention to the preoperative imaging. I think this could have been prevented. So uh, the two reasons for presenting this case were some transverse fractures I think are easier to do from the front and always check both SI joints and really pay attention to detail. Uh, you know, I got, I got sidetracked here and uh, didn't fix the left SI joint, which I probably should have. And at the time of surgery, you know, we did, uh, I always stress it, uh, but you know, it's not, in a young person, you're not going to get that much mobility necessarily. And I couldn't uh, really, uh, under fluoro uh, determine much uh, in the way of mobility. And this is her, uh, our her Jude views now. So uh, that's basically, I think the bottom line is uh, for me, uh, there's no cookbook approach. Some transverse fractures uh, need to be fixed from the front, at least uh, I think that's a better way to do it. And uh, think about the sequencing, what is constraining what, and it's not always back to front, but generally speaking, you want to constrain the back and then do the front where there's more forgiveness uh, 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 last.
And uh, so let's move to this uh, patient here. Sir, sir. Uh, yes, so there yes, was sir. a complex forces. It was a compression and shear both. In yes, I, this this patient was uh, dragged by a vehicle. So I think it was a, a, a for sure a complex uh, uh, force that uh, it created those posterior injuries as well as the transverse. It must have been an impact from above and in front that pushed the transverse open in the front and uh, broke the rami and then opened both SI joints. I think it was uh, indeed a complex uh, injury. So this is a patient, he was a, a motorcycle crash, uh, hit by a truck um, and, uh, you know, a young patient. So a young patient, 43, here are the, uh, the pictures here. And uh, so this is an associated both column. Uh, it's a high energy uh, injury in a young person. And to me, this piece is problematic. Uh, on the iliac oblique view, you see that posterior column piece. And um, if you look at, uh, we'll go through the, uh, the uh, images here. So first of all, you can see on the right side, see that fracture going into the SI joint there, the iliac fracture. So that's a posterior iliac fracture going into the SI joint. And here, you know, the typical piece, but also if you look here, there's a piece that's coming into view that is separate from everything else. And that to me is a difficult problem. And we'll go through this one um, here. So the inside, you can see that piece. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we go around, there it is there. Yeah. And that to me is a segmental posterior column and a fracture that goes into the SI joint and to me, I can't get this from the front. So it's either a sequential approach or a, uh, an extended iliofemoral. And this is, uh, you know, Dr. Magoo had, had asked about the vascular injury. This is one where you see how medialized that piece is. And as you're uh, sort of shoehorning that out under, maybe go back, uh, as you shoehorn that out uh, yeah. and push it, the, the, the vessels are right there you know, the superior gluteal artery and also the internal iliac, they go right along the crest there, you know, and you have to really be careful. Uh, so for me, uh, this is not a simple approach. And uh, I think these are the options, uh, an extended iliofemoral or um, two, two approaches. We don't do two approaches simultaneously anymore. We do them sequential. Uh, when I first uh, started here 25 years ago, uh, Dr. Stephen and I were doing some where, you know, um, he'd do the back and I'd be in the front. And, and, and we, we just, even with two experienced people, you, you just, I think, are better off sequencing it rather than compromising on both approaches. And then think about HO prophylaxis, how you do it, uh, and, and uh, restrictions and so on. So we did an extended iliofemoral. Our practice is to use uh, post-operative a single shot of radiation. Uh, this is uh, the case, as you can see, the staples are still in to show the approaches that were used. And of course, a true osteotomy, not a slide. Uh, uh, and and uh, you can see that we've been able to restore the posterior board of the posterior column quite nicely because you're, you're looking right at it. But you can see the, the anterior part here is imperfect and it's really difficult to get the front uh, perfect from an extended iliofemoral approach because you're pulling, you're pulling everything in. You're not pushing, you know, from the inside out. Uh, so, and, and this patient, uh, he had a head injury as well. He started weight bearing early, got a little bit of heterotopic bone despite uh, uh, the uh, uh, radiation. And here he is at four years out. He doesn't have any pain. He's a bit stiff. Um, but you can see the heterotopic bone. He's a bit stiff, but he doesn't have any pain. And uh, so far, so good at four years. He's a little bit, I think this was done in 2012. So he's longer out now. I haven't seen him for some time, but get reports from his uh, family physician uh, that he's still doing fine. So uh, for me, uh, this is an extended approach. Uh, I use uh, radiation. 
can you give some pointers as to reduce that keystone piece which is the sciatic buttress region uh, piece uh, sorry you want to uh, trick trick to uh, reduce that can you give pointers which is very tricky that keystone piece which is uh, near the uh, sciatic buttress oh the, the the this piece here yeah uh, you mean this piece right here can you see that uh, the no no, no 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 sir that spiky piece which is dangerous piece that is the keystone piece which okay. you said that you pulled it rather than pulling uh, would you have been buttressed from the inside oh i see so this piece here is that can you see my yeah, point yeah yeah yes is this see. the piece you're referring to yeah okay so this piece is connected to the posterior column so it's actually not as difficult because you see it's connected to the posterior column so the reduction is a clamp through the sciatic notch, a short angled clamp and uh, anchoring that. Let me see if I can stop it there. So uh, let me go back a little bit. Yes, so a clamp through the sciatic notch and anchoring it on uh, this piece here. Then the whole uh, construct has to be pulled underneath that. So, you know, remember you're in the lateral position uh, for the extended iliofemoral. So, you know, there's some traction required. You, uh, we put a, a sharp hook. Uh, I didn't use in this particular case, a. Uh, we, we did the osteotomy and you can put through that cancellous bone, a Steinman pin. Uh, but in this case, we just used a sharp hook to pull the uh, femoral head laterally and uh, a short angled clamp through the sciatic notch. This uh, piece here is a real, important landmark and that is the piece that we do second so first is connecting this big iliac wing piece to this piece second was actually pulling this piece out underneath it third was reducing this uh, intercalary posterior column and then fourth was fine tuning this this was already pulled out underneath the iliac wing uh, fourth was to pull this piece in uh, against this piece with a short angle clamp. So that was the sequence that we did for this. But pulling this piece out underneath the iliac wing to me is important because you can't get any of the other things reduced without that being under the iliac wing. Does that answer the question? I'm, I'm not, yes, I hope yes, I understand. Yes, yes, Thank yes, you, sir. Um, so this is a 15-year-old uh, who uh, fell off a snowboard, and uh, I think you can see that this is a transverse, and uh, I think it's either transtectal or juxtatectal. Um, certainly at the age of 15, you know, you'd be very keen to get this back perfect. This is the uh, CT uh, scan. And you can see that I think there's a little bit of uh, condensation right there on the issue pubic segment. So I called it transtectal. And uh, there's a bit of comminution in the front. And uh, this is the 3D here. Uh, it, it's fairly, I don't know, uh, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and, and so the question is, what to do with this you know he's 15 he needs to have as perfect a result as we can make and um, you know is this uh, an extended approach is this two approaches or a single approach so i struggle with these and these are the types of cases that we you know bounce around each other i think this was a transtectal uh, case uh, we can talk about roof arcs and non-operative, but all bets are off uh, if the head is displaced, as it is in this case. We don't actually use this very much, to be honest, uh, the roof arcs, but it is something that the learners, if there are any residents on the call, will want to be familiar with. And so the posterior roof arc needs to be at least 70 degrees. Clearly not the case here in this particular case. And again, Tornet has talked about non-operative management. So... Uh, you know, these are all the, the things that we have to think about for every acetabular fracture. Again, aiming this more at the residents and learners. What position, what approach, what approaches, reduction fixation, and what if plan. The what if plan or plan B is very important. So let's say you decide you're going to do this from the back, but you can't get the front reduced. 
then what? What, what you, you have to think about, okay, uh, what's my what if plan? What if I can't get the front reduced from the back? What am I going to do then? And uh, then of course, uh, post-op activity. And I think, you know, we've all uh, talked about this. So um, here's what we did. This was, uh, and I'll just show you the Davies before coming back to that. This was done through a posterior approach. And uh, we uh, thought we were able to get the front uh, together quite nicely, uh, uh, anterior column screw, and then uh, fixing the back. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's done, done well. I last saw him a year after his surgery, and he told me, yeah, I'm fine, I'm back to playing soccer. And I, I don't know how to think about this. You know, on one hand, I'm happy, okay, he's doing well, he's playing soccer, but he's got cartilage damage that I know will um, eventually lead to arthritis earlier than if you didn't have that cartilage damage. So I'd be interested to hear what my colleagues do, but I, I get a little worried when the patients uh, are doing such high-end activity at such a young age. Uh, on the one hand, you know, he's a young kid and uh, you want to let him enjoy his life. But on the other hand, uh, you know that it's, it's uh, going to catch up with him down the road. So I, I don't think it's, it's a philosophical question. It's not a medical question, but, uh, uh, but that, that was the reason I presented that, to, to hear your thoughts on that. I think we've got a few minutes left to present this last case, and then I'd be keen to see some of your cases. Uh, this is a case that I thought I, I would actually uh, pick your uh, brains over because this is unusual for us, this late presentation, but my understanding is that you uh, have to deal with this more commonly. So he's a 35-year-old guy. He was vacationing in Cuba, and he uh, came back, presented to us. He had injured himself two weeks ago. It took him two weeks to make it. Uh, back to Canada. And here he is, his hip is clearly still dislocated. And, uh, you know, he's two weeks out now. Uh, what uh, the, the resident called me up and said, what should I do? Should I try a closed reduction in the emergency department? Uh, should we take him to the operating room now? This was in the evening. Uh, and, uh, you know, should I do a reduction and then get a CT scan? Or should I do a CT scan now? And these are all uh, discussion points, and I can tell you what we did, but I don't know that there's a necessarily a right and a wrong. We did the CT scan, and you'll see here uh, when we did it. Um, and, uh, you know, here he is, and he's still dislocated. And the reason I, uh, I saw the plane films before making this recommendation to get the CT scan, first of all, he's been out for two weeks, but second of all, this is a very cranial posterior wall. And even if these present acutely, these are very difficult to hold in joint. And in some cases are incarcerated and, you know, an aggressive reduction attempt can actually break the femoral neck. So I was going to take this patient to the OR anyway. And so we got this CT scan to sort of confirm what I think I already knew. You can see that there's right on that view there, there's a bit of anterior uh, bone fleck, that's parts of the posterior wall that you can see there. And you can see the marginal impaction there and this very cranial uh, piece. Uh, this is the uh, 3D. And you can see again that very, very cranial posterior wall. And, uh, you know, he's in traction at this point, but not a formal close reduction attempt. And, uh, you know, we put him in traction to get as soon as he came in, but didn't uh, sort of try a formal closed reduction, which would have failed anyway, I think, because it just would slide back out into that area. So, and if you go through there, uh, see there, the posterior column. So this is actually a posterior wall, posterior column with a very cranial posterior wall. So, and, and presenting it two weeks out. So my thought was that this is quite fragmented um, I plan to do this with a trochanteric slide, which for me is a lateral position. Um, you can certainly do uh, a trochanteric slide prone, but for me, it's easier in the lateral position. And my plan was to clean out the joint, fix the posterior column, and then uh, leg and buttress the wall fracture. 
So that was my plan. And we did that not in the evening, not at night. We did that the following day, or actually not even the fall. We did that a couple of days later. He was in traction in the meantime. This is him at two years. And uh, he's, uh, you know, this is a uh, uh, two year follow up. So not, not so long out, but uh, he's done pretty well. You can see the construct that we used and uh, the trochanteric slide uh, fixed in the way we did. He's a larger individual, as you can see by a bit of the panis. And you can see here that he's already got some degenerative changes in the uh, femoral, on the femoral head. He's got, you know, a, a, a bump there. And I think his joint space is starting to narrow, but that was, that was our strategy. So um, I'd be interested, uh, you know, I think we've, we've, uh, finished the half hour that uh, we said we would have got lots more cases, but I'd be keen to to, to see your cases. Uh, but these are uh, the things that I thought uh, were difficult. You know, how do you manage a delayed presentation? Uh, what do you do with this very cranial posterior wall acutely and definitively? Uh, how do you get there? And for me, that's a trochanteric slide. And this is a posterior wall, posterior column, which in my experience has the very worst uh, outcome. Um, I find those very difficult to, to deal with. So with that, I think I'll stop sharing screen and, and look forward to some, some more discussion. Yeah, Professor Krenner, when we Professor, about... there is a question from the audience. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear. What is your management option for severely comminuted posterior wall fracture, which is not amenable to put a lag screw and a buttress plate with an unstable hip. Yeah, so, you know, the issue with marginal impaction is, is easier if you've got a large piece, like the one that I showed where you put the intercalary screws in. If it's really comminuted, um, I don't think those do very well. And uh, I'm talking about the marginal impaction portion. If the marginal impaction is very comminuted, those don't do very well. I don't worry so much about a comminuted cortical piece. It's the articular cartilage comminution that uh, is really difficult to deal with. So I do, like everybody else, I try to elevate it with as much, uh, you know, cancellous bone as possible. I try to bone graft behind it and I'll close the wall. And then for the comminuted uh, cortical pieces of, of wall, I'll simply put some uh, hook plates on there and a buttress plate. I won't bother with lag screws if it's that comminuted that I can't anchor it with a lag screw. But I, I think, you know, the, the person that asked the question, those are very difficult fractures and uh, they don't have a good long-term prognosis if the articular cartilage is uh, so smashed. And in an older person, uh, you know, I might consider even an acute total hip replacement. We, we wrote about this, uh, you know, quite an old paper now, but our suggestion at the time was to maybe consider a total hip in a person with such a fracture over the age of 50. Now that I'm 60 years old, I think that's much too young. <laughs> I wouldn't consider that, but you know, it depends not on the age, it's more the, the bone quality, I think. Regarding this kind of a impaction, Professor Prader, we had seen many of these excessively comminuted pieces. And then uh, we, I started doing about 10 years back, uh, iliac rest graft shaped like a posture wall, stabilizing that. And now I have got about seven to eight years follow-up outcomes also. So we published about five years back and then subsequently same paper, they have been uh, subsequently followed by some Chinese article also. And they have also their series of those using a liquorice graft. Now question comes how a liquorice graft can give a articular cartilage. So I went into the literature to look at it. It is said that a kind of a fibrocartilage might develop in that area, which can give a kind of a time Maybe eventually it will end up in an arthritis, but you get a very stable kind of a THR also at some stage when it is to come up also. But my case, I have about eight years follow up in my, I think in, uh, the most followed case. R other cases are relatively less than that. And they are right now okay, have not gone for a replacement. They are getting degenerative. Is this um, the the cortex you put against the joint? Is that the, yeah. Uh, yeah. the cortex? Yeah, yes. that's very interesting because, you know, um, uh, my my very first uh, uh, research uh, work was with Bob Salter, uh, 
uh, using continuous passive motion. And my particular project was using periosteal grafts and putting those in rabbit knees and subjecting them to continuous passive motion. And, and we showed that some actually hyaline cartilage was generated. So that's very interesting work. Uh, and, and I look forward to learning a little bit more about it. Um, I, I, I think, I wonder if, uh, you know, the, the iliac crest has enough pluripotential cells to actually result in metaplasia for some cartilage to be produced, you know. It might be even more successful if there was some uh, bone in a young person that had some periosteum, because the periosteum we know can result in metaplasia. I think these are very interesting solutions to this difficult problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, with it is, we have published it in International Orthopedics Journal also about five years back with the case also, and as that case is still with the follow-up. And when you say about neglected, we don't take two weeks as a neglected because our late weeks, the last, uh, the one of the case I did after one year of dislocation also, where mm -hmm. we could get a reasonably good outcome subsequently. Yeah. So the, it basically depends upon the comminution. If it is excessive, obviously any delay will be as bad as anything. Just like in your case also, it is excessively comminuted. So more delayed the case is more worse likely to be the outcome. But in not so for two weeks for us is a very routine kind of a delay. I mean, it's not the kind of delay we are worried about. But even with it, delay, it that long. yeah. Well, that's very interesting. So, Lokesh, are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, shall I go back? Yeah. So, this was a 54 year old uh, gentleman. Um, with a road traffic accident. As we see, there is a, a sacroiliac disruption on the left side. A fracture uh, involving the both columns looks like more like a T-type and pubic symphysis disruption, more like an implosion injury. And those are the cuts we have of the you know, CT scan axial cuts. So there is complete disruption of the sacroiliac joint. So, um, so, um, of course, hemodynamic instability has to be addressed first. And uh, so I want uh, Professor's thoughts on, uh, in such a scenario, how would uh, the close reduction be done? And uh, uh, what is the order of fixation like? I mean, he had one of the cases. Um, uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So this is more difficult. Uh... Uh, a closed reduction, and you may not get a closed reduction without addressing the pelvis, because as you pull on it, the pelvis is mobile. It's a completely unstable hemipelvis, right? So uh, you may you may try to pull on it and get a closed reduction. And I guess if you're in a hospital where you, you know you're not going to do the definitive work, you might you know put a chance pin into the iliac wing and try to stabilize it while you're doing a closed reduction. But I think the the real the thing is for us, if this presented here, this would be an urgent case to take to the operating room. And then, you know, uh, the order of fixation is, is uh, the key. So for me, this one would be um, an anatomic reduction and stabilization of the sacroiliac joint to start, because then I've got something to work with that I can build the hip around. Uh, if you don't, if you try to do the the uh, acetabular fracture first, it's very mobile, and you won't necessarily be able to uh, pull that piece down to get an accurate reduction of the of this T-type fracture. So for me, this would be a a prone approach. Uh, it would involve uh, potentially some traction, but certainly an open approach to the iliac joint. And then um, I like to uh, do just, uh, you know, the usual iliosacral and transsacral screws across the, the joint once it's reduced. And then to uh, address the uh, uh, hip, it depends on the patient's stability. You know, at this point, you should be able to get a closed reduction. So it's sometimes better to come back and fight another day. Uh, you know, and once you've got the joint reduced and the posterior ring fixed, you reassess, is the patient stable? Are you still 
energetic enough to carry on? Uh, is the team good? And then if yes, then I would carry on with the uh, uh, prone uh, Coker Langenbeck in this case. I, I wouldn't do a Gibson in the prone position. And uh, I would see if I can get the anterior column reduced uh, through the notch. Uh, and then if I can, I would stabilize that and then try to reduce the posterior column. And there's some uh, tricks that, that work in some uh, T-type. This wouldn't work here. Sometimes you can displace the posterior column and see the anterior column through the uh, fracture. I don't think that would work here because uh, the, 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 it's working more or less as a unit, except for the obturator ring. It is scissored a little bit, but you don't want to disrupt that connection that there is through the caudaloid fossa area just to you know, see the anterior column better. So I, I would try to just uh, work through the notch here to do that. And then the last thing is to constrain the symphysis. And uh, for me, that would be flip supine and uh, plate the symphysis, but I would do that last. So that would be my approach, but I don't feel ashamed to you know, fix the pelvis. And then if the patient is a little bit unstable or for whatever reason to you know, come back and, and do the rest another time if, if you know, there's an indication. I think you're muted, Dr. Lokesh. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, do you differ, differ or the same approach? The, the, my only perception is when I look at this spectrum of injury, I, there is a combination of a transverse kind of a fracture where the femur had implored, it goes inside. It actually displaces the ilium outwards which goes on to disrupt the sacroiliac joint and sacroiliac, basically that ilium is pushed out and the anterior fragment is pushed in. And the first step for me is reduction of the hip. Once you take the hip down, your rest of the things will try to be easier to find them back. So first thing will be taking the uh, hip to its normal location, which being a transverse kind of a fracture, there's enough uh, weight bearing dome also. So it will get reduced, it will be stable. And now I'll try to reduce the, uh, as uh, Professor Penner told, go stepwise. But my, because this is a very classical pattern, which happens by the force from the trochanter to the femur head, which goes inside. And once it is going out inside, it is actually pushing out the ilium. And once it pushed out the ilium and ilium from the sacroiliac joint starts disrupting backwards. Many cases will uh, settle at anterior opening. Many will go to the posterior opening and some will take the ligament and a kind of a sacral fragment also along with it. So this is that spectrum. And the root starts from the femur head. So reduce the femur head and then the thing starts falling back into their line. So you mean the, the, the there is an attachment with the femoral head, all the fragments? And that no, if you pull no, no. that, if you, you pull that mechanism, uh, mechanism of injuries, femur head splitting the two things and then taking both the things apart and then hitching it in a way so that the ilium is pushed out. So you're that, reversing, you're that reversing the forces in that same yeah, manner. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That is uh, sir, that is absolutely true. What we did, actually, the longitudinal traction uh, helped us reduce the. Uh, uh, Trans, uh, the T-type fracture significantly, but for fixation, both the fragments were mobile. So we started off with, uh, uh, you know, the fixation of the sacroiliac joint first. Uh, let me click once on the slide, then it will yeah. move. Click once on the slide. There you go. <laughs> Dr. Navin Thakkar is the pro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. so, so it saves the time. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> So what we did is uh, we gave longitudinal traction and we could reduce the uh, uh, fracture. Uh, but um, the fixation, we started with the sacral leg joint because both the superior and inferior fragments were mobile. Uh, once we fixed the sacral leg joint, we were not so uh, happy. We actually put in a screw also. But uh, then we opened anteriorly because the, to reduce the pubic symphysis and not fix it, just hold it in place so that uh, we can reduce the anterior column. And then we uh, read, uh, held the pubic symphysis, fixed the anterior column. And then we, uh, you know, uh, because we did it with ilofemoral and, uh, you know, AIP. And then we uh, made him, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was floppy lateral. So we made him uh, 
turn around and with the cockle angle back and fixed it yeah um, maybe uh, uh, as professor told we figured have done the sacral leg joint from behind uh, and a uh, couple of interfragmentary screws for anterior column and uh, only posterior wall posterior fixation we could have done away with the uh, you know only pubic symphysis fixation but uh, yeah this is what we did actually uh, you would like to hear your uh, thoughts both professor hans krider and uh, professor sen yeah professor sen why don't you go first and yeah no my perception is exactly once as uh, lukesh said it when he the hip was reduced now the question is the ilium is totally a free fragment so this needs to settle down i don't know why we had a difficulty in getting it reduction when it was a totally free fragment and it was linked with the femur head down there with the traction so probably uh, the fixation anteriorly you try to reduce it out it might have come but the uh, the disruption was significant as i see from the previous pre operative x ray is also there was a very significant disruption so probably that gave a, a kind of a problem and rest i think as you rightly said it out you had a temporary stability at the pubic symphysis level now you could hold that anterior column fragment and you could push it back to its own position so i would have gone with the exactly the same way uh, i just want to know it what was exactly the problem in getting the sacroiliac reduction otherwise once that is reduced we could have definitely got one or two screws across and would have been a stable kind of a fixation and once you were there with the iliofemoral approach to get in i think you could have really judged about it so the difficulties were probably there in getting the reduction so what was that you are muted lokesh yeah you lokesh you are muted dr lokesh you are yeah i got it now so uh, the problem was actually we did uh, the iliofemoral approach and we try to reduce the sacral leg joint through the iliofemoral approach i mean reaching out the sacro sacroiliac joint because of the obliquity of the fracture uh, we were not able to uh, you know reduce it because it was going all the way all the anterior intermediate and the posterior fra fragments were reduced we try to use a farabof and you know try to put uh, two screws in the one screw in the sacrum and one screw in the uh, ilium and try to reduce but still uh, the it, it it took some effort but once we actually uh, gave lateral pressure from uh, you know uh, through a percutaneous uh, pin into the ilium we were able to reduce it so i think that's the reason what helped us so it is the trying to reduce from the front was causing the frag joint to open up but once we put in a, sh a shans pin or something from the side to push the sacral leg joint back into place that's how it got it reduced yeah okay Yeah, I think that the the principle is, uh, you know, to get before you know the reduction is uh, obviously uh, you know there are differences if you go front or back. But I think the principle is exactly what was done here: is to reduce and stabilize the back, and then to deal with the acetabular fracture. So uh, you know, I think, and and for the for the residents and learners. Uh, you you always critically look at the uh, obturator foramina, and they've been nicely restored here. You know, if you uh, if you have distortion of the obturator foramina, then you know you haven't got the T quite right. You know, and in this case, the T was managed with a sequential approach, front and then back. And I think the the bottom line is you, you do whatever you need to do to get the the reduction of both the front and the back columns uh, with a T that's critical. now the question is which is better prone position will be better for the forces of getting the reduction or a supine position that is a question uh, the prone position is more challenging to get the reduction of the iliac wing without a few little tricks the reason for that is when you position prone the pelvis you know i've got a pelvis here in front of me when you position prone the pelvis wants to open up and you know if you're supine you can control that a little bit better so in the prone position you know uh you have to use bolsters along the chest like our spine colleagues do if you're going to go prone otherwise you will build in a malreduction of the sacroiliac joint you can feel the front and and feel it and you can see the back and you can put you know clamps across and so on but uh the bolsters if you go prone need to be i think along the chest rather than across the anterior uh superior spines 
and uh, that will prevent that deformity. If you can get anything, everything from one approach, you know, that I think is ideal. Um, so there's nothing, it's personal preference to some degree, you know, there's no, you know, this is the right way or this is the wrong way. You know, people have different preferences. So for example, Mike Stover, he will do every sacroiliac joint that he does open from the back. I will do most from the front. You know, it's, it's partly whatever tips and tricks you have to, to make it work in your hands. But you, you have to, I think you have to be flexible and know both ways of doing things. Uh, thank you. I think I'll close that. Uh, the other speaker will have to present his case. Uh, thank you for your inputs. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Very good me. case, Dr. Lukesh. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, okay. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. On behalf of uh, Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Trauma and Orthopedics, Karnataka Orthopedics Association and Bangalore Orthopedic Society, I extend a very hard note of thanks to Professor Kreder for sharing his knowledge and experience. He has made acetabulum fractures doable like any other fractures. We are truly inspired to do better. We are equally grateful to our moderators, Professor Ramesh Sen, Dr. Uday Kumar, Dr. Lokesh, Dr. Dr. Naveen Thakkar, for bringing up a good topics of discussion. We wish to have you all again for our future meetings. I'm sure that our audience are delighted to have learned something new which shall help them in the patient care. We shall make this record recording available for those who couldn't make it today. I thank our director and our HOD for bringing about this initiative where all of us get an opportunity to know and learn from our colleague from different parts of our country and world. Something to feel better about this in this pandemic. Lastly, thanks to Olympic Pharmacy for sponsoring this event. Have a good night and happy Diwali. See you all next month on second Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to. Uh, it's been my great privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you to Sito Thanks and uh, my uh, colleagues, Bangalore friends. Orthopedic Society and Karnataka Orthopedic Society for oh. allowing us to uh, co telecast. So it is also available, video is live available on the Facebook and the Gujarat Orthopedic Association. I shared the link here in the chat box. Thank All you. Right. Thanks again. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Greta. Thanks a lot. Take care, Professor Sen. Hopefully we can meet again sometime soon in your country or in ours. Yeah, surely so. As sure. as okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lokesh. Bye.